Honor. I am so excited to be here um, with you and with panelists really from all over the world. As we will um, see, we have uh, people from um, the US, from Greece, from Italy, from South Africa, and people talking about Russia as, um, as well. So um, a really, really exciting panel to um, look forward to. Um, we'll, um, the, the panel is brought to you by the Potcomer Center for Educational Justice and Equity, which is uh, the uh, new center that the PD Green launched uh, in uh, January of this, uh, um, of this year. Um, with the generous support of um, Charlie and Cordy Potcomer. The goal of the center is to identify and promote best practices in the field of carceral and reentry education. In particular, we're focusing on what's really the um, key, what are really the key areas of expertise of the PD Green program that are tutoring, academic support, college and career readiness uh, programs. We want to build on uh, the expertise and the net network um, of the uh, PGP while also centering uh, the voices of and experiences of incarcerated and, inc and formerly incarcerated people to really be doing research uh, um, with them alongside uh, um, people who are in prisons and who have been uh, impacted by the criminal legal um, system. Uh, to just give you a sense of a few of the things that we are uh, we are doing in the uh, with with the center, uh, we are working on launching a new um, ESL uh, program, so a program for English as a second language. Uh, uh, preparation, uh, as well as evaluating our college readiness program to see really what, um, how much of the research that exists uh, on uh, uh, traditional college campuses, on what works uh, uh, in terms of preparing people for uh, for college, how much of that um, can be translated in, uh, um, in inside programs. I am Chiara Benetolo, and I am uh, the executive director of the um of 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 the center. And uh, today, I bring you. I'm going to introduce uh, the um the panelists in clusters. We will do uh, a bit of uh, uh, presentations from each uh, um, geographical area to start with, uh, and then we'll uh, come together for a bit of a uh, roundtable discussion, and finally um, share, open it up for uh, for questions uh, from uh, um, from you, the audience. As a reminder, um, uh, we cannot uh, we cannot hear you, we cannot see you, but we can see the chat. So uh, please submit um, any questions that you have in the Q and A section. We'll keep an eye on it while panelists are talking, and then uh, um, start answering some questions uh, towards uh, um, to towards the end. Um, so. Without further ado, let me introduce uh, the um, the first panelist, um, Dr. Baz Dresinger, who is the founding executive director of Incarceration Nations Network. It's a global network that promotes uh, prison reform and uh, reimagining justice uh, across the world. Um, she is a professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice uh, at the City University of New York uh, and the founder of John Jay's uh, groundbreaking prison to college pipeline uh, program, which provides uh, university level education and reentry assistance uh, to incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people uh, throughout New York State. She is uh, the author of the critically acclaimed book, uh, Incarceration Nations, uh, A Journey to um, Justice in Prison Education Around the, um, the World. It was named a notable book for 2016 by the Washington Post. And she's also the uh, director of Incarceration Nations, a global docuseries, uh, um, which premiered at the Tribeca Film uh, Festival in, uh, um, in 2018. Um, she has been multiple times a, a Fulbright uh, fellow and a Fulbright scholar. Um, uh, she regularly publishes on outlets like uh, the New York Times, uh, collaborates with the National Public uh, um, Radio, and uh, the list of her achievements goes, uh, goes on and on. Um, 
with her, also part of the Incarceration Nations Network from South Africa, um, we have uh, um, Caitlin Lee Jardim, who is a um, research assistant and a project leader at Incarceration Nations Network. Um, um, she spearheads uh, the Incarceration Network's education, not incarceration pillar of the work. Uh, and uh, um, she's currently leading the development of a global student network for formerly incarcerated scholars uh, across, uh, across the world. She obtained her BA um, at uh, Stellenbosch University, which I hope I'm not, um, I'm not butchering. And uh, uh, in the same university, she runs the um, Ubuntu Learning Community, a prison education initiative that offers incarcerated students and the university uh, students a chance to, um, to study together. Um, and the last uh, of um, last but not least person in this cluster is um, uh, Kofi Danzo, um, who is the reintegration leader at the Ubuntu Learning uh, um, Community. Um, again, a uh, partnership uh, with the Correctional Center and uh, um, and and, uh, and and the university. Um, Kofi enrolled himself. Uh, in uh, this program uh, while he was incarcerating and now he is completing his um, law degree at the University of, uh, um, of South Africa, which is uh, congrats, uh, Kofi. Baz, Kayleen and Danso and, and, and Kofi, floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to all the attendees. How wonderful to see such a well-attended webinar in the days post COVID. Um, which is testament to P.D. Green's great work and, and reach. Uh, so I am uh, going to give give everyone a, a bit of an overview of my and INN's work in the education, not incarceration space. And then I'm going to pass it on to my wonderful comrades, Caitlin and Kofi, to share in more detail about some particular initiatives, including the Ubuntu learning community. Uh, so INN, uh, Incarceration Nations Network, is an outgrowth of my book. It was a somewhat accidental outgrowth of my book. I didn't know that in writing a book it would become a movement, but with all of the connections that I started building around the world and doing this work, it seemed natural to form a network that brought everyone together um, on the same page, both literally in terms of a website and metaphorically um, in order to, to create collaborations transnationally. So we are a global prison reform and justice reimagining network with partners all over the world, quite literally. We have 132 partner organizations uh, in more than four dozen countries doing a range of work in the space of prisons and justice. So everything from legal reform and advocacy, policy work, restorative justice work, reintegration work, um, and of course, education work in the context of prisons. And as a network, we, we, uh, we work to elevate and elevate and collaborate with our, our partners' work in various arenas. Um, so we do a whole host of work, but education, not incarceration, is one of our pillars as an organization and very, very central to the work we do. Some of this is because I myself, uh, my work in the space of prisons was born in the context of education. As you mentioned, Kiara, uh, I founded the Prison to College Pipeline at John Jay College, where I have been based for the last 21 years uh, and spent a decade building it and seeing it grow and thrive um, and seeing our graduates do all kinds of incredible work, including be a regional leader uh, at PD Green, one of our one of our incredible graduates, Matthew Wilson, um, worked with PD Green for some time. And uh, it became clear to me as I began doing the work transnationally uh, that the space of education in prisons uh, and higher education in prisons in particular was a central point in this work um, and was relevant whatever country uh, I was working in or whatever country our partner is working in. And I think prison university partnerships are so critical for multiple reasons. Uh, one is that uh, the the development of directly impacted leaders is which is central to the movement in whatever country you're in um, hinges on so much the existence of 
access to higher education. That is not to say that um, all leaders in the movement necessarily attended university while in prison, um, but a tremendous number of them did. And it is a breeding ground for community organizing, for directly impacted leadership, and it's critical in that respect. Uh, it is, of course, we already know, it creates avenues for opportunity. Um, it is, universities are, for the most part, as compared to many other entities, apolitical. So it is very helpful in a country where um, programs tend to get politicized to be able to have a program through a university that is focused on education um, because it manages to bypass uh, so much of the politics. And uh, lastly, it's so critical to the broader purpose of so much of the work that we have to do, especially in the global South, is around decolonizing uh, places and spaces and opportunities and creating avenues to education uh, and particularly higher education uh, is part and parcel of the decolonizing of so many of these universities um, and creating a scenario where, where we're truly um, moving towards social inclusion, which is, is, is vital. Um, so uh, as we launched, as I launched INN and as we built as, as an organization, building prison university partnerships became central to the work that we do. Uh, so I myself began doing that first uh, independently in the context of bringing uh, prison to college pipeline type initiatives uh, with an emphasis on the pipeline piece. Uh, one of the lessons that I quickly learned early on was that uh, any program that is not creating a connection between inside and outside is doing a disservice to, uh, to its participants and to its students. And so there was a lot of encouragement around uh, ensuring that whatever program began on the inside continued on the outside. Uh, and then thinking creatively about the many different ways that prison university partnerships can look. There is no one model. Um, there are certainly many things that cut across borders in terms of the way these programs look. Certainly the importance of bringing students from the outside into prisons to engage with their incarcerated peers uh, and thereby shifting the whole culture around, uh, again, campuses as often very privileged spaces, uh, shifting the thinking of the next generation of leaders, all become so tremendously important. Uh, and so early on, I was planting a lot of seeds. Uh, as of last year, we uh, at INN signed a partnership with the Bard Prison Initiative to globalize some of the work and to build a community of practice, a global community of practice that was able in its first year to support a number of programs around the world uh, and, and see them either get born or grow. And so from Argentina to Mexico, to Jamaica, to South Africa, uh, it was a beautiful thing to support these programs, um, to see them be able to thrive, we also held a global convening in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Argentina has a very rich, rich history uh, of prison university partnerships. And so we held a global convening where our partners came, were able to share, build, learn together, um, and think about what advocacy looks like in a very public way for these prison university partnerships. We also hired a research uh, fellow to focus on the study of prisons and education in a global sphere. This year, we were able to uh, hire a research fellow in the journalism space who's going to be covering mainstream stories about prison education in a global context. We see a lot of attention paid to the US all the time in these issues, but we don't often see the kind of support and attention uh, in a global context for the work. So um, it's been an enormously, I'm giving you the nutshell version, so, um, so, so we have time for all of us. Uh, but I also encourage you to watch our, we have a docu-series, uh, as was mentioned, and one of our episodes is called Education, Not Incarceration. Uh, you can learn more about some of our partners in the global space in this work. Uh, our new uh, aspects of this Education, Not Incarceration pillar is a very exciting one, and I'm going to pass it to my comrade, Caitlin, to share more about, uh, about that project, which we're currently building. 
Yeah, thank you, Baz. I just want to check, can you hear me? So I speak on. Great. Yeah. So um, just a little bit of background first about myself. So I happen to be a uh, outside student who partook in the first ever inside outside program yeah, in South Africa that was started it was the first South African um, edition of the prison to college pipeline that Baz started in New York City. So that is how I got into this. And that is where I met my colleague who's on this call coffee. And since then, I have dedicated, I have a legal background, but I have dedicated my career and my time and my efforts in making sure people who are incarcerated have access to education. That is my, that is the, at the center of my heart in everything I do. And so when Baz asked me if I would like to lead um, a project that brings together students who have studied whilst incarcerated, of course, <laughs> yeah. um, and that's what we're currently doing. So the idea is that students all around the world who have experienced um, some form of education behind bars come together and build a global network. For the purpose of this network, the name of this network, its goals or to be determined by the students. Currently, we have um, partners in the UK, in Argentina and Brazil. Nigeria and South Africa, um, all working together to build, to build the first edition of the global network with the idea that we will expand to other countries, which is also why I'm so excited to be on this call, as it's also a great opportunity to learn more. I have never met anyone in this space from Russia or from Greece, so these calls are really, really fantastic, and I'm, I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, then a little bit more about the Ubuntu Learning Project and um, just prison education in South Africa in general. So South Africa too has a very good deep history of prison education. In fact, it started with Robben Island and the, on Robben Island with Nelson Mandela and freedom fighters who fought for their right to education. They pushed the apartheid government to formalize the, the informal education that they were doing on the limestone quarries. And they fought and they fought and eventually they won. And to this day, the University of South Africa, UNISA, they still provide incarcerated students all around South Africa um, opportunities to complete degrees whilst they are in prison. The Ubuntu Learning Program, which is the program Coffee and I are, for, are part of, uh, a version of Prison to College Pipeline South Africa, is the only program in South Africa which um, has some form of um, person, personal contact or personal lecturers. So it's a short course program, um, a year long short course program. It's interdisciplinary. So we have um, an economics lecturer, a um, history lecturer, a legal lecturer and a um, literature lecturer on board. And they come every Thursday to the prison alongside 20 Stellenbosch University students. And they study with 20 incarcerated students. Everyone in class is on equal level. Um, and it is not your normal lecturing style. So it's no one is the expert on any topic. And through this engagement, we have seen just incredible things from our students, including Kofi, who is on this call, um, and then other students entering in the space of activism, um, working in um, paralegal spaces and in community safety spaces, all who have participated in the course and are now doing incredible things on the outside. So yeah, um, where we are currently, we have the opportunity to expand our project into a female correctional center, which we are super excited about. And then we're also starting initiatives of just getting prison education a hot topic in South Africa. It really isn't. There is little to almost no research on the topic. Um, and so that is what the gaps that we're exploring now that we could potentially fill. And without further ado, I don't want to take too much time. I'm going to pass the mic to Kofi um, to introduce himself. Uh, thank you so much, Caitlin. Um, uh, greetings, everybody from uh, South Africa, uh, city of Cape Town. Um, I always like to open um, with the words of our late great icon, uh, our former president, 
Dr. Nelson Mandela, where he quotes, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Education, the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. These words resonate with me very strongly as a person that is system impacted, um, having spent seven years of my life in incarcerated. I chose the path less traveled, which is the most difficult path to follow um, whilst incarcerated, which is a path in education. Um, I studied law, as Kate introduced. Um, I did uh, my LLB. I'm currently in my last semester. Uh, so we'll be graduating uh, during the course of 2024. Um, it's, it, to say that um, this journey has been mind blowing will be putting it mildly. Um, I met uh, Dr. Barris Javinder in the year 2018 when she introduced uh, the prison college pipeline to um, South Africa. And since my release in 2019, um, I've been incorporated into the INN family, uh, working as a reintegration um, leader for the Ubuntu learning community. And this has also aided me in, you know, assisting our fellow brothers and sisters when they come home, you know, um, to be able to continue the good work that they, they started on, 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 on the inside. Um, like Dr. Bears mentioned, uh, we're fortunate enough to receive some funding from Bob, uh, whereby we were able to last year help four of our students, uh, which is two on the inside and two on the outside, to be able to continue their studies and two of our students are graduating this year. So social justice initiatives are very new in, in, in the South African landscape, but I think that we are on the right track and having access to you know, such powerful minds, uh, people that have been doing this for years, is also grown, uh, allowing us to grow in stature in this field. So I want to thank everybody, and thank you so much for, for the warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you, everybody from Incarceration Nations and, and South Africa. Um, I'm already seeing a lot of interesting threads uh, emerging from uh, um from your uh, from your speeches uh, so let's move on to our next uh, country or um geographic area um with uh, uh with with Greece uh, and then um again please um keep thinking about your questions uh, there will be time to um to ask them at the um at the end so uh, from Greece, uh, or about Greece, uh, we have uh, uh, Dr. Nani Panurgia and, uh, um, and, and Mary um, Grizu. Uh, I, uh, Dr. Neri Panurgia is an anthropologist and the academic advisor at the Justice in Education Initiative and um, adjunct prof associate professor at the prison education program at Columbia um, University. Um, through this um, institution, uh, she teaches uh, in New York State and federal prison, uh, prison system. Um, her last book was uh, published in Greece uh, in uh, 2020 and uh, um, came out in English translated as uh, um, the Foucault uh, Node, Leros uh, and the Grammar of uh, Confinement. Um, and and uh, Mary has been the director of the Fur Chance School um, at the Diavata prison in Thessaloniki, Greece. Uh, she has been teaching English to incarcerated people for uh, 12 years, and she is uh, interested in uh, um, prison adult education. Um, she holds a BA in English literature and language, and MA in creative writer writing, which is really fascinating. So floor is yours, Nanny and Mary. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chiara, and thank you for putting this uh, together. Uh, a great big thank you to Pithy Green for having um, helped us at, uh, at Columbia all these uh, years um, with tutoring. Um, I will I will yield the floor to Mary to Mary Krizu, who has a lot more to say about <clears throat> about the uh, present. Um, educational conditions in uh, in the Greek prison system, uh, especially since she's the director of uh, one of those um, one of those uh, correctional facilities. Um, I I will just say um, I will talk about two things. One is uh, the beginnings 
um, of uh, prison education in, in Greece. And then I will share with you um, a project uh, by uh, an organization, non-profit organization that's called Caravan, um, uh, who does uh, a number of, uh, um, of programs uh, in, uh, in Greece, uh, in the, within prisons. Um, and they have been trying to put together a zin, a prison zin in uh, in the Greek prisons. So I'll talk about that, which is connected to the um, uh, to the present educational uh, conditions in uh, in Greece that then Mary will take off from. Uh, I want to say that, as we all know very well, um, systematic prisons did not exist until the beginning of the 20th century. And they were systematized primarily um, as places of confinement for political prisoners. And it was those political prisoners, um, of course, Mandela, Nelson Mandela was uh, was mentioned, but in um, elsewhere, in, also in, in South Africa, you know, the Boers War and the concentration camps uh, there, those were um, those were holding political prisoners. But uh, in, uh, in Greece in particular, um, political prisoners started uh, being imprisoned uh, with the um, rise and uh, establishment of the um, leftist, socialist and communist uh, movements. And those those first political prisoners were um, a mix of very well educated persons and people from the uh, proletariat, and it was in those in those in those spaces that the need for um, education, as Baz said earlier, education not incarceration, um, the need for education that would actually uh, prepare. Uh, better citizens to um, to uh, uh, create a resistance movement towards the onslaught of um, capitalism, actually, um, and its systems uh, was formed. So from the early 1920s, uh, until the uh, until 1974, when the last political prison was um, was uh, closed in in Greece, political prisoners were take had taken over the um, the project of educating the younger generation of political prisoners on one hand, and uh, some of the uh, non political prisoners in uh, in the Greek uh, prisons. They um, they went. They started these um, very systematic but non-recognized um, schools in prison that went from primary education all the way up to uh, tertiary education. Uh, building on that model, uh, and makers will talk to us more about this. I think uh, building on that model, the the left wing Syriza government that was in power in Greece between uh, 2015 and 2019 um, allowed for the first time in the um, criminal prison system. So not <clears throat> um, not within the context of um, of political. Um, imprisonment, but for political prisoners who still exist in Greece right now, for political prisoners allowed um, people to um, uh, obtain, to study for and obtain their PhDs. And uh, the presumed leader of the um, urban guerrilla organization November 17th, um, Yotopoulos was um, the person who actually received his PhD in um, uh, computational mathematics um, in uh, while in while incarcerated. Um, so I, I wanted to say that and now I want to um, I want to share with you um, uh, the the project this project right here uh, the Hughes um, the Hughes project. I'll put it in the uh, in the chat. Oh, right there. Uh, Kiara is many steps ahead of me. Um, 
So if you could uh, go, it is a, it's an initiative that is being uh, supported by the Stavros Niarchos uh, um, Foundation for Public Humanities. And the project in which I was um, uh, involved and where um, three, um, uh, three JIA scholars who have come home from Sing Sing and who are um, part of our of our JAA Scholars Program uh, also participated is the project on um, on creating a zin, and one of the things that came that became apparent uh, in the context of that is the fact that in uh, in Greek prisons right now, as in uh, I think most European prisons right now, the the greatest hurdle is common language. So a lot of programs cannot be cannot be effectuated because there is no common language between the uh, among the uh, among the uh, incarcerated persons, and it is um, a further. Uh, uh, um, Pro problem with that, um, and so uh, hurdle, is is the wonderful, <laughs> the wonderful fact that people in Greece do not remain incarcerated for uh, the length of time that it takes to learn uh, to learn another language, a common language. So the uh, in Greece the longest um, the longest uh, uh, time that anyone could be incarcerated is 16 years and we have people who of course uh, go they're being sent inside for with two or three year uh, sentences um, which does not allow for for a systematic long-term um, uh, instruction in in language so I'm, I'm sure that Mary Grizzle will talk to us more uh, about this. I don't want to take up any more of her time, but I um, I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. And thank you again for the hospitality here, Mary. Thank you for inviting me, first of all, and uh, Nemi, first of all, and the rest of you. Uh, you can do this very quickly, Chiara, because uh, I feel a bit awkward because you provide uh, university programs. Here in Greece, we are a very low level, although it started during dictator uh, in the years that Nanny talked about with the prisoners. What we have in Greece are second chance schools. The main level of education in prisons are second chance schools, they, uh, which are equivalent to a junior high school. We don't, uh, there is a law that started in uh, 2018 and there are about 25 of our squad directors of education in general. And we can uh, found um, primary schools, high schools, senior high schools or, co or colleges, uh, but it's not organized as I see in your countries, as I saw Buzz uh, talking or Nanny telling me about what's going on in the state of New York. So what I've got here is basically the second chance schools, which I repeat, uh, provides uh, the three years of junior high school. So what we have is a big problem, as Nanny mentioned before, we have a lot of people who are foreigners. Uh, the last year, a lot of refugees who have come illegally into the country. Uh, whereas in the past, we had Albanians, Bulgarians who lived who already worked in Greece, so they knew the language and they could communicate in prison. Now it's a bit, it's a big problem. And if we only have these second chance schools, which are only two years, and uh, the government, the ministry doesn't try to create more levels of education, whatever they've learned these two years will disappear in the end. So we're not really providing them as much as, it's not well organized, it's not well organized. And it's up to us, the directors, to pressure uh, the people who are in charge to try to make other uh, educational structures. So the main core, core of our schools is this, and you can see the lessons that are taught there. Uh, there are people who go to university, but no university in Greece 
provides programs as you do in the States, at least from what I talked when I talked to Nanny uh, a few days ago. Uh, there are some students who, uh, if they were going to university before they were incarcerated, they can uh, um, ask to continue. Uh, it's not always accepted, though. We've had problems with a lot of students. Uh, the Magis was one of them, other students who tried, and uh, instead of letting them stay in the city where they could attend the lessons, they punished them, sending them to other prisons where they couldn't uh, attend their lessons so they couldn't continue with their studies. Uh, there are some students who have got scholarships and go uh, and do it online on the Open University in Greece. There were scholarships given the previous years. Uh, in our, in our uh, prison in the Avatar, there are eight students who are doing an undergraduate course and uh, two who are doing postgraduate. One of them is in medicine and one who's going to a technical college. But generally, uh, from the 33 prisons that we have in Greece, only 12 have schools, the second chance schools. There are two or three that have formal education, like a primary school, high school, uh, high school, junior and senior, but for juvenile students in Avalona. Uh, so we have to try, we have to keep in mind that they're adults, right? So we have to use the principles of adult education. Uh, you can go on, Carol, you can go on quickly. It's just pictures. Uh, and because of the prison itself, these are books that the students have written. Uh, the prison itself doesn't provide any educational programs. So all the educational programs or whatever art programs are done, this is a previous student of ours uh, presenting his, uh, his uh, work, uh, is done by the school. So it's a lot of, um, it's a shame. It's a shame. They like getting exposed to art. We've done a lot of things. We've... Uh, uh, but uh, there's no continuation. In that sense, I feel a bit, not pessimistic, but discouraged. And I've been doing this for 12 years now. So I'm still trying very hard. Uh, as you see, they take exams in Greek uh, for the foreigners, uh, in English to get a diploma for ECDL. Uh, we try to do events. But sometimes I feel that we're trying to give them things that they can use when they go outside. But if there's no continuation of their education, I don't know how much we can really achieve. So I feel that Greece is still at a very uh, low level and I feel very humble in front of what you're doing in your countries. Thank you, Mary. Um, I actually think that you have a lot of amazing programs sounds like and very very much needed uh, despite uh, despite all the challenges so and, and um with with continuity with the um with the programs that you have just uh, presented i am now going to um go on uh, to our italian organization that is also a um a, a smaller but very mighty organization from uh, um from venice um, um, we have uh, representing them um, Giulia Ribaudo, who is a, a graduate in um, has, has a degree in philosophy from the University of Venice and is a founding member of uh, um, of the organization Closer. She has been involved for several years in um, in in prison and educational justice in Italy and in France. She was worked for five years in a consortium of social cooperatives um, that did job placement of incarcerated and formerly um, incarcerated people, and currently works as an HR business partner with a create for a creative agency dealing with sustainability and uh, diversity, equity, and um, and inclusion. With her talking about um, Closer um, is uh, Lisa Canyon, uh, who is a volunteer with the uh, with the organization. So Lisa, take us away. 
Yeah, hi everyone, and thank you very much for having us. It's really not so common for us to get the chance to talk of what we do inside the prison. So really, like, thank you. We are a bit excited. So, and um, I mean, thank you. Um, so um, we are a closer which is the cultural association established in Venice in 2016 um, to promote a cultural activity within the Judecca's prison. Uh, just to provide you some information about uh, the place where, we're, where our activity takes place, um, Judecca is an island inside Venice. And um, Giudecca's prison is an all-female institution, unlike uh, most Italian penitentiary institutions that have uh, women sections within them. So um, all our activities are actually designed for those women who are incarcerated there. Um, also, the structure of this institution is a bit different from other, as it was a former convent. Um, so, what we do, um, our main activities, um, is to organize a series of uh, literary, literary ev events uh, inside the Venice, Venice Women's Prison uh, that are open to the public and uh, led by the female um, uh, inmates. So um, on this occasion, uh, women uh, lead the meeting and question the writers um, that is invited by us. So um, the first phase of our project takes place inside the um, library um, of the prison, where with a group of, um, of women, we um, uh, meet them and um, read the book, we analyze it and prepare the meeting. Um, so um, for us, uh, the main goal is to create a relationship between the, uh, the inside and the outside so that the citizenry understands that the prison is a place of their city. And um, we decided to use uh, art, literature, to make this kind of connection um, because we believe that having, having access to, uh, to it is one of the pillars of, of a real re-educational path. And for us, and we believe that actually culture is um, a source of, um, of dialogue, of escape and exchange. So, this is actually what is the most important thing for us. And um, yes, this is just to give you an overview of our main activity. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for, for this presentation uh, um, and, and for all the work that you are, um, you're doing with, uh, uh, with the women. Last but not least, uh, we have Jose uh, Vergara, um, who will uh, um, take us a, a, a bit back in um, in history while remaining focused on the uh, the question of literature and um, and, and and writing that 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 happens uh, in uh, uh, inside prisons. Uh, um, Jose Vergara is an assistant professor of uh, Russian uh, on the Myra Cooley leadership um, lectureship at the Bryn Mawr College. His uh, primary current research project analyzes Russian prison writing since uh, 1991, so since the, um, after in the post-Soviet period, and he has taught in prisons uh, as well in the U.S. Uh, since uh, 2000 uh, and, and the 11 through the Inside Out Prison Exchange Program and the Wisconsin Humanities Prison Project. Uh, so, um, Jose, take us to, um, to Russia. I will share your slides. Thanks. Um, yeah, and taking us there only virtually through some slides for, for now, unfortunately. Um, thank you, Peter Green and, and Kiara, for um, arranging this, and thanks everyone for being here. Um, I'm going to really try to stay uh, on time since I know we want to get to the questions. Um, Kiara, I'll just let you know when to switch slides, if that's okay. Um, as, as Kiara mentioned, I'm doing 
approaching this from a slightly different angle. Um, as Kira also said, I'm uh, researching, studying contemporary Russian prison writing. Um, and today I just want to provide a kind of broad overview of this topic, kind of trends or ideas within it. Um, and I'm particularly interested in thinking of prison writing as a reflection of what happens inside the prison, um, as well as outside it, that prison writing isn't actually limited to what's produced in prison or what there are texts, works that describe the prison space, but rather also ones that um, show how the carceral system expands outward beyond the fences, beyond bars into everyday, you know, so-called everyday lives outside of it as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, but before that, before diving into that, I did just want to acknowledge, you know, last Thursday, some of us met to plan this event, um, and then everything changed the next day when uh, Alexei Navalny um, uh, was killed, uh, di died in, in the Russian prison in the Arctic Circle um, on Friday. And um, I just think it's important to acknowledge this and acknowledge his death, not only because he's uh, killed and is a man whose family is in mourning right now, um, whose body is being used as a, as a tool by Putin's regime, um, but also for what he represents and what he represented for the future of Russia, but also the many other people who have fallen into the system and forced into the prison system in Russia um, and killed or suppressed in various ways. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, next slide, please. As I mentioned, I just want to provide a quick <laughs> overview. Happy to take more questions or um, delve into it and make other connections. Uh, next slide, please. Um, on contemporary Russian prison writing, I want to start with this question. What is prison writing or Russian prison writing in particular? And the way I'm thinking about it, um, among other things, takes on these questions or topics that prison writing, as it is elsewhere, but we're looking at the Russian context, a form of self-preservation, a way that writers are making sense of their experience and um, preserving their uh, identities. Kiara went out of the slideshow. Oh, sorry. That's all right. Um, preserving their identity through putting their experiences down on paper or in drawing. There's some um, really fascinating combinations of text and image in some of these works. Um, it's a protest against power in that it describes things that aren't usually seen if you aren't inside a prison, of course. And then uh, what I think is particularly significant and important in the Russian context is that it's a tradition that almost every writer, I would say, who's writing in prison, um, at least those that manage to get their voices out and get published, are thinking about those who came before them, that they're taking the ideas, images, tropes, experiences that others have produced or gone through in the prison space during Soviet times or before um, as models for what they're now documenting or now what they're doing. It's, it's always this long lineage. Next slide, please. Um, so again, just a few examples. There's certainly memoirs, the kind of things that come to mind probably um, when you think of prison writing um, in the Soviet context or uh, elsewhere. Um, so we have works like Oleg Navalny, Alexei Navalny's uh, brother um, um, memoir, which hasn't been translated into English, and I'm including mostly works that have been translated into English um, in case anyone wants to follow up. Uh, or Mikhail Khodorkovsky, who uh, was an oligarch, maybe remains <laughs> and such, uh, their memoirs of their experiences or the memoirs of a couple of Pussy Riot members. Um, one thing that I want to highlight here is that these are docu documents, um, memoirs about their individual experiences, but they also paint these portraits, a kind of anthropological approach to painting portraits of others in the prison space. And it becomes not just about the individual, but the collective. That's, I think, really important. Next, please. Um, again, there's documentation um, in other Russias. For example, Victoria Lamaska, um, she's a, a, a graphic reporter, produces these kind of graphic novel-esque uh, accounts of various um, other Russias, kind of lesser seen places and groups in Russia, and has gone into, um, or, or did in the past, um, youth detention centers and did drawing lessons and documents what's happening there. Next, please. Um, another major trend that I think is uh, significant and worth uh, recognizing, I suppose, is this turn toward historical fiction, how 
contemporary novelists are setting their plots in Soviet Russian um, gulag camps, um, turning to the past to kind of explain what was happening then, as well as to make connections to what's happening now, um, to kind of explain how we've gotten to where we are. Uh, and there's many examples of this. And then finally, um, as I was saying earlier, kind of expansion in the representation of what prison literature is. Um, Ali Firuz, for instance, was or is a journalist and writer whose journal or diary um, documented his experience in a um, migration detention center. He's um, Russian, Uzbek. Um, so again, just sort of shifting the borders of what this genre can be. Next, I will go very quickly here. Uh, next slide. Um, again, these are the organizations I was involved with and organized this exhibition of um, uh, art and writing and various and music produced by um, incarcerated men at the prison in Wisconsin that I uh, taught at. Next slide, please. And then just real briefly, um, on this slide and the next one, there's a link, I'll put it in the chat as well, but it's this uh, scalar book that Sudan and I put together in a course on the history of Russian uh, prison writing, the whole history, not just the last 30 years, that has um, kind of pages for various texts in case anyone wants to learn more about various examples, and then essays that contextualize and situate um, many of these texts, um, again, from different periods of, of Russian history. Um, and then last slide is just my email. If anyone's curious and wants to reach out, happy to follow up as well. Thanks again. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Jose. Thank you to everybody. Um, to conclude uh, this uh, uh, journey through the world, I will say a couple of words about what we do at the, as the PD Green program in the um, in the US. We um, have been around since uh, 2008, and we are now the largest uh, provider of uh, uh, tutoring and academic support services for uh, people who are incarcerated and formerly incarcerated um, in, in the US. We are in seven states, plus uh, Washington, DC, all over the, the East Coast. Uh, and uh, um, as I mentioned, we focus on on tutoring and on preparing people for um, for colleges, and now also going into preparing them for uh, for their careers, their next steps. So, um, we, um, yeah. So we, we the, our principle is we take volunteers um, who are uh, um, most typically college students uh, from uh, various colleges. Uh, we partner with more than 50 colleges and universities. We train them and we bring them uh, um, inside correctional facilities or in reentry programs to support uh, uh, people who are incarcerated you know, re-entering with meeting their, um, their academic goals. And our mission is really a twofold mission on the one hand it is supporting the goals of incarcerated people and on the other is educating our our volunteers many of whom I know are in the audience of this uh, of this webinar on uh, the injustice that is manifest in uh, the um, U.S. carceral system and as of today on uh, uh, the injustice manifested in uh, uh, many other carceral systems across um, across the world. So I want to get us started with um with with some question a brief conversation um among uh, um as uh, um, the, the 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 panelists and then we will um open it up for um for for questions from uh, from from the audience. And I want to start. Um, we we saw so many trends uh, um, that that I, I think will be really interesting to um, to touch on, right? The importance uh, of uh, um, colleges, but also of uh, other educational programs that are not uh, that are not colleges that are equally, I think, as important, uh, um, like uh, the, the 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 secondary schools uh, that um, we learned about in um, in Greece, uh, uh, like the um, cultural projects projects uh, done by uh, by closer in um, in Venice uh, but another um, side of the question that I seem to um, uh, to emerge from all of um, 
in the presentations is uh, um, a lot of the work that everybody here is doing is not just about uh, um, providing services and programs to support the incarcerated people, but it's also about educating the broader public about uh, the um, realities of incarceration and really bridging that gap uh, between the outside and, um, and the inside. So I'm curious if... Uh, any of you wants to um, share a bit more about that? Why do you think it's important? Uh, uh, what are some of the challenges that you're facing? But also, um, how are you seeing that working? What are the successes that you have encountered in this space? So um, I can say something about it as it's actually one of our main goal to reach and engage the community participation actually. so. This is really important for us. As I said earlier, it's mainly because uh, we want to open this a dialogue between, I don't know if I'm right, if I'm, I will use the right words, but between the victim and the aggressor, let's say. So we want to uh, um, start a dialogue between them. Um, and the challenge we are facing actually is to, um, persuade the prison system that these projects really uh, that that engage the outside are crucial for social reintegration because we want we we cannot put them apart without really having the chance to get in contact with the rest of the world if we want them back that's our goal actually I'd agree with, um, I don't remember your name, sorry. Uh, it's Lisa, but it doesn't work. Lisa, yeah, from Italy. Um, I think there's a power play between the educational systems in uh, prison and prison as a different structure. Uh, they want to suppress them because that's their role, whereas we want to free them. And a student in one of our books, because we do creative writing, we have a project we've been doing for many years now. We've They've written six books. So it's so we, the Europeans, are a bit similar, right, with Fosse and with uh, Lisa, uh, with writing. Uh, we want to free them. And a student of mine had written once that and going to school and doing all these uh, art programs is uh, the legal escape. You said something, you mentioned that before, Lisa. So... Uh, doing, um, having activities, writing, having books or having events where you bring the public inside, you open this uh, window, this this door, is a way to change the stereotypes that people have about uh, incarcerated people. And we see that when we have uh, events at school or when we have uh, events out school in museums or uh, students come from universities and work um, voluntarily at school. So it's very important to keep this door open and keep this, this communication. And it's not just, I not just say that for the, for the people outside, but even we who go work, we go with stereotypes and we change uh, when we go there. So I think that's very important. It uh, goes double ways. Yeah, I think that's a very, very good um, topic, um, Kiara, one that I, I feel very closely to, because one of my experience, I've, I've been fortunate enough to travel to the USA, um, and I've had experience of this, of prison education there, and I'm actually mind blown by the amount of interaction from the communities and societies, they are very connected with realities of incarceration, um, where in South Africa, what's going on in prison and the roles that prison plays in our society is actually a distant imaginary thing for most people. Um, most people in South Africa, their perception of prison is informed through media. Um, I, so often we get asked about the world's toughest prisons on Netflix and that kind of thing. And so when that is the narrative that is coming into our society, and we know because we've had experience that that is far from the reality, um, it becomes incredibly important to try and change that narrative on the outside too. It does not help that you change 
oh, that you have any impact inside a facility if you're not changing the minds of the people on the outside too. Um, so yeah, that is something very key for what we're doing now as well. And um, I can speak from my own personal experience. Before I went to prison, I absolutely was obsessed with crime documentaries and I thought I wanted to be a criminal lawyer. In fact, I wanted to be a prosecutor. And then I went to Brunflake Correctional Facility and I had the opportunity to sit across tables from incarcerated students. And I was absolutely mind blown by the intelligence that people have decided to lock up behind bars. And uh, it was through that experience that I am now an, ad an absolute activist for um, prison reform and justice around the world. And so I always say, I wish I could take everyone to prison so that they could have that experience. But we know that's not possible and also not good. So it's about finding ways of sensitizing communities in other ways. Um, yeah. And I'll add to that that the um, so I'll say a word about backlash. I mean, it's especially relevant here in South Africa, but also in throughout the global south. I think one thing that Americans uh, don't realize about this space outside of the U.S. is that uh, there in the U.S. there is a, a, a plethora of financial aid opportunities, access to higher education for people. Um, to attend university. I mean, I'm at CUNY, we're affordable, we're accessible, um, there's TAP and Pell and so on and so forth. In so many of the countries where we work, South Africa being one of them, there isn't access to education, higher education for, you know, the average Joe citizen on the street. And so that also generates a lot of anger and frustration on the part of people on the outside when they learn, oh, you're educating people in prison, but I can't go to university. I don't have access and I can't get to Stellenbosch, but you're giving it to the people in prison. Um, and so you tend to experience a lot of that uh, outside of the US and particularly in the global South. And so engaging with the public to help them understand why this is so important, why it benefits all of us for there to be access to higher education and prisons, why we're in this together as a society. And if we're genuinely interested in creating opportunities and, uh, and, and getting rid of the levels of social exclusion that produce crime, it's critical for there to be access. And the work that we do with building global um, communities of practice, and particularly with the student network, we definitely see this as being vital, is we want to create it such that it's a global norm that there's access to higher education in prisons, that whether, you know, in the eyes of the prison authorities, in the eyes of the public, that this is not some crazy radical notion to but rather um, an absolute global standard of what should be expected in the con as long as we have prisons, we have higher education opportunities in prison and to just normalize this as being hugely important um, for all of our uh, safety and liberation. I, I I completely agree with uh, with everything that uh, that Baz and uh, and Mary just uh, just said and Lisa. Uh, I just wanted to to add that this is precisely why uh, on campus programs uh, such as the one that John Jay has and the one that we have and other other places in the in the city, right? Uh, uh, St. John's and uh, St. Francis and, uh, you know, um, that's why it's so important because they are so important because what they do is that they actually uh, open up the space of uh, carceral and post-carceral uh, education so that the, I mean, at Columbia, we have integrated, and I think that we are the only, I know that we are the only Ivy, we have integrated classes, right? So people who come from prison, decarcerated persons are put in classes with the regular um, Columbia undergraduates or Columbia graduate students in some cases. Um, and so so the, the there is this diffusion and de-escalation of the of the notion of the 
criminal individual, right? The dangerous indiv individual that exists uh, inside inside the uh, inside the prison system, and I think that, that is it's extremely important as a as a step towards educating the wider public um, about what it means to to be a prisoner or to have been a prisoner but we what you were mentioning as we we said i have seen it in the uh, in the us also i have seen whenever i i post any of the um announcements um of programs that we do at columbia where we i see in the uh in the comments below people saying oh i didn't know that i had to be a criminal i didn't know that i had to commit murder in order for me to be able to go to columbia and and we and in those in all those cases and all those uh comments i take time <laughs> that i don't have in order to respond and set the narrative on a different on a different level. Thank you. Yeah, I, I I agree that I've heard that comment about the 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 in the U.S. as well quite frequently, and uh, um, and clearly it seems like in uh, in other countries uh, in uh, in the global south it seems even more um, even more prevalent. Really really interesting to learn. Um, I have. One more question for us to talk about collectively, and then I want to open it up for uh, for questions from the uh, from the audience. I have many more in mind, uh, but but I want to make sure that we get to. Um, I I see the a lot of questions popping up in the um in the chat that are really interesting. But before we move on to that. Uh, um, I'm curious about any new programs, uh, new research uh, projects that you have. What is it that you are working on? Um, that that like what what's the latest? What's a new direction? Uh, um, if you have any uh, anything that you would like to see happening uh, um, in the in the near future, I think there was also a question in the chat asking you about um, what do you want to happen in the next uh, uh, in the next five years in your organization or in your um, in your countries uh, and uh, and also please let us know how can we um, how can we support you if people are interested in learning more of course we've been putting a lot of links in the chat but yeah I'll start <laughs> so we have uh... We've already shared uh, much about what, what we have in the works for the Global Student Network. Um, and we have big plans for that, to build that out in terms of the activities um, and really using it as an advocacy platform and having it also intersect. Another one of our projects at INN is called the Global Freedom Fellowship. In fact, Kofi uh, is a 2023 Global Freedom Fellow. It's a fellowship for formerly incarcerated leaders from around the world to come to South Africa for two weeks and collaborate and build transnationally. Um, so we are building that out and see a lot of interest. There's a lot of intersections. Many of our fellows studied while incarcerated. Um, and so that, uh, and we see creating really this platform uh, that is almost a consulting agency of formerly incarcerated leaders globally who can be called upon um, for all kinds of, of exciting projects. And um, we'll definitely be circulating a lot of calls to action around these things. Uh, in our global community of practice, for instance, our, uh, our partner in Brazil, who is looking to launch, has all the permission and all of the green light to launch the first in-person program in Brazil. I think actually that's a point that's worth mentioning. Um, because it hasn't been mentioned thus far. Generally speaking, when you find programs outside of the US, they tend to not involve in-person learning. They tend to be correspondents as University of South Africa is, Open University in Nigeria and many others. Um, and while we support all kinds of education and value all forms, um, it, it definitely isn't the same when there isn't an in-person component. And so we're we're a big part of our advocacy work also is around building out these already exi existing excellent programs that are correspondence and figuring out ways to add in-person components to them um, and preferably student involvement. So the, the program in Brazil is actually uh, potentially the first in-person program in the country um, and was just, uh, they, they were... Uh, 
almost a finalist for getting funding from the government. So we put out a call to our community to vote for them, to support them. So we're always doing those kinds of call outs on our, um, for our newsletter, sign up for our newsletter, our socials at Incarceration Nations uh, and, and our Facebook, we're on Facebook too, Incarceration Nations Network for all of our call outs. Thank you. Yeah. And I just wanted to say, like, as I mentioned earlier, there's a massive gap of, in research on prison education in South Africa. So I am currently um, exploring um, opportunities for our um, alumni, as well as myself, to pursue research in, um, in the field. Um, I am actually in the process of registering for my master's. I'm at the proposal stage. Um, and one of the obstacles, funny enough, is that I actually want one of our ULC alumni who are still incarcerated to um, be a, um, to co-write the thesis with me. Um, it's somebody who has also completed their undergrad studies already and uh, is at the point that they can write the masters. So I'm trying to overcome the um, institutional obstacles to have that done, considering the university, Stellenbosch is an in-person campus university. So they don't do, they don't really allow correspondence on the master's level. But hopefully with a little bit of push, we can get that done this year. And yeah. I am very interested in collaborating on prison education research projects, um, but in doing them in ways where um, a system impacted people are leading the research. Thank you. That is so interesting. And it's something that we've also um, talked about here inside the PD Green program. And I know in preparing for this um, of this with this, this webinar, uh, the importance of having, uh, um, uh, you know, really being in active dialogue uh, with, uh, with incarcerated people and learning from all the um, culture that is being uh, produced inside, um, inside, uh, in, inside prison. I know it's one of the tenets of the work. That, that closer does to um, that really um, having that sense of there is a lot that we can learn uh, from uh, from the people who are um, who are currently incarcerated. Okay, so if we don't um, have any other immediate answers, uh, I will uh, open it up uh, for for questions uh, from uh, um, from the audience. Uh, I know we already have a few in the chat. So if you have any other questions, this is uh, uh, this is the time to, um, to put, it, put them in here. Um, one question that I will start from uh, is someone asked uh, if uh, uh, for-profit prisons exist uh, um, outside the um, outside the, the US. Um, if any of you has insights in that, and I'm actually going to um, have the question a little bit um, broader. We know that for-profit prisons are a particularly controversial um, way uh, of uh, um, incarcerating people in um, in the US. US, but it's certainly not the only, and one may even argue not the uh, the main injustice uh, that is uh, um, in uh, um, in our system. Uh, we know that uh, uh, the incarceration of uh, people of color at disproportionately high um, rates uh, is. Uh, um, is rampant in the um, in the US and one of the. Um, the main injustices in the system. So I'm curious to hear more of your perspectives on uh, um, the structures of uh, um, of prisons in your in your countries, uh, uh, the kinds of people who are further marginalized uh, uh, within the um, the prison system, and really the systemic injustices that um, everybody is trying to um, to fight in their own ways. There are no uh, for profits. There are no for profit prisons in in Greece, and I think, I think that that is the case throughout Europe. Some one of the, uh, maybe Lisa or someone for who works more closely with other European uh, prison systems might know better. But that, but there are no um, private prison systems. I mean, private private prisons in uh, in Greece, and there are none in New York State either. 
not yet in Greece, but there is a um, uh, there is a tendency here in Greece that they do want to make uh, private prisons. And today, it's such a coincidence because today um, a law was passed for a new penal code in Greece, which may, which became much more uh, much stricter than it was. For example, like. Uh, if you go to a hospital and you talk to the staff rudely, you might get a year in prison. I'm talking about really ridiculous things. They've made the um, the punishments really strict. And um, I personally think this is a bad, a bad turn in the penal system. And I could see my students today, they were all in agony, you know, what's going on? It's going to become stricter. We will never be released from prison. So that is a, uh, but there is a tendency in Greece that they do want to make uh, private uh, prisons, but it hasn't started yet. I don't know about the other countries. So I have a chapter in my book on private prisons around the world. Um, there are at least a dozen countries that do have private prisons. But the thing that's important to recognize is that it's not necessarily about private prisons or not private prisons because state prisons are just as government prisons are just as embedded in capitalism as private ones are most of the time. So it's really more about asking broadly speaking, how intertwined are money making enterprises um, and justice systems. And they are deeply intertwined all over the world. And that includes pockets of governments being lined um, by, you know, various contracts and things like that, you tend to find that that one way or another, there is a connection between um, and prison labor, cheap prison labor. Um, I know that our our comrades from Brazil are here and that is a big issue over there. Um, how many people in prison are working cheap, you know, getting paid at a fraction of the price and sometimes again, not getting paid at all. Um, so all of these things are, you know, there, there's prison industrial complexes everywhere, and every country also has its othered population, whatever that looks like. Um, so, you know, while in the U.S., obviously, it's it's black and brown people, um, in, in many other places, you're talking about Aboriginal people or, you know, other indigenous people, um, you know, foreign uh, language was mentioned, so... Um, you know, whether it's people from other countries and, you know, quote, foreigners, um, poor people throughout the global South who might as well be uh, their own race in so many respects in terms of the way that they're mass incarcerated. Um, so you you I you tend to find these things from one country to the next, not operating identically per se, but in terms of this nefarious relationship between capitalism and, you know, criminal legal systems. Yeah. I, I think, but, oh, I'm sorry. Was it? Just real quick. Yeah, I, I think Russia is a good example of this um, with all the graft. Um, there's no private prisons, but certainly the government uses labor in prisons. Um, you can read, for instance, the Pussy Riot memoirs, their accounts of working, sewing, or, yeah, sewing, um, uh, in people being used in these labor camps, um, just like in the Soviet Union, just like elsewhere. And then more recently, a kind of different angle to this, there are reports of like uh, up to 100,000 um, incarcerated people being sent to fight in the war in Ukraine, being freed, given this, this choice to fight in the war, um, uh, to, to be freed from prison. But, uh, you know, obviously that's not, not a choice, <laughs> really. Um, uh, yeah, these entanglements that I think uh, Baz is speaking about um, everywhere. I, I just wanted to uh, mention, because we haven't mentioned it at all, um, that in the case of Europe, that what is private is the entire Frontex enterprise. And the, the incarceration of refugees, that is which has been... Um, uh, uh, handed out to the private to the private sector, and we see there uh, stark differences between the ways in which there's 
awful state-run prisons are being run and the awful ways, the other awful ways in which Frontex is running its own concentration camps, uh, having having claimed uh, native soil in, in Greece and in Italy and in Spain, for Frontex uh, uh, international inter-European space. Uh, and there, the, the no government, no national government has any um, access to either decision-making uh, process other than handing over the, the space um, or in the ways in which the, uh, the constra these concentration camps are being run. Thank you. And for those of us who don't um, necessarily, uh, that, that are not European, uh, Frontex is the European agency uh, tasked with uh, managing, uh, um, like roughly speaking, managing the uh, the borders uh, and the um, and 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 migration uh, coming into uh, the, uh, the into Europe. Uh, yeah, and I think the eyes of Europe. The eyes of Europe. Yes. Uh, and that also speaks to uh, really the widespread use of um, carceral spaces and logics uh, uh, to to punish uh, all sorts of people, right? Um, from uh, uh, from people who are uh, convicted of crimes uh, to uh, people who are migrants, uh, and we could go on and on uh, about disabilities uh, and uh, and all sorts of things, right? So um, yeah, closer. Yeah, we, we just wanted to confirm the fact that also in Italy we don't have a private prison, but um, I mean, um, prisons are state institutions and also just businesses, private businesses can, can actually activate job placement, for example, for uh, inmates. That's the private part. Is there? Do you know if there is a um in, if there is a regulation around the wages that incarcerated people are um are paying paid in those placements? Uh, well, I'm asking because we know that in the U.S. Uh, uh, when incarcerated people work uh, is uh, for uh, a ridiculous amount of money. I think the average is forty three cents an hour. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, we know that um, uh, they active. I mean, businesses can can activate um, employment uh, contracts for them. So yeah, that's really interesting. And yeah, I mean, there's a, a reduction of taxes for oh, uh, those, like tax incentives uh, uh, for employing yeah. uh, currently yes. incarcerated people. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. In Greece, uh, people are not allowed. They, they might work to maintain the prison or to clean uh, the offices in prison, but they, they do not get wages. And uh, what happens is that um, their punishment is reduced. Like if they come to school, it's one day less for each day. Or if they work inside the maintenance, the electricians, the plumbers, it might be half a day. If they work in uh, prisons that are uh, cult uh, agricultural prisons, it's one to three. So, but they they they're not paid mm -hmm. for that. There's mm -hmm. no wage in prison, Thank money you. wise. Thank you, and I'm I'm seeing some. Uh... Um, some comments in the chat. Uh, I'm talking about prisons in uh, in Mexico as well, uh, where uh, um, the the warden uh, was the also the owner of the prison. Uh, um, people being paid uh, minimum wage uh, in those uh, um, in those uh, in those prison jobs. So, um, I think we could keep talking forever. This has been such a uh, such an interesting and generative uh, discussion. Um, unfortunately, we have to um, to wrap our conversation up. So I do want to thank uh, once again uh, um, all of the um, all of the panelists uh, and. Uh, um, Thank you for joining us. Thank you for sharing your um your experiences. Thank you for to uh to the people who have been uh, um listening for your uh, for your engagement and uh, um and participation. Um finally um uh, Sarah I think we have a um slide on uh, um supporting the um the PD green program uh if uh, 
as I mentioned, uh, the, the PD Green Program is a nonprofit organization um, that works uh, inside uh, um, prisons, uh, and jails, uh, as well as reentry programs, so all across the um, Northeastern uh, United States and, uh, um, and growing. Uh, um, we are supported by a um, number of, uh, uh, of grants as well as individual um, donations. So if you are interested in learning more um, about us, uh, we have put our, our link in the, um, in the chat. And if you're interested in, uh, um, in donating to us, also the link is in the chat. If you um, heard anything interesting and you want to reach out, please absolutely um, reach out. Uh, um, you can find uh, my email address, maybe Sarah, we can put that in the chat as well. Um, as well. Please, please feel free to uh, to reach out to um, to me. And uh, if you're interested in talking with any of the um, of the panelists uh, and you didn't catch their um, their contacts, uh, I'm I'm happy to facilitate those uh, those connections as well. Thank you so much, everybody, and have a great rest of the day. Have a great evening for those who are in a different time zone. Uh, uh, I am, uh, it uh, speaks uh, so much of the interconnection that we were able to create that I think we have um, three or four different time zones in, uh, um, in this call, which is uh, impressive. Thank you all.